It is not only on the way you talk, but on the way you carry yourself, etc. You know, verbal and non-verbal both. In fact, specialists say that non-verbal is more than 80 percent. So, that I am standing in front of you has more of an impact than what I am saying. Only 20 percent is what I am saying and 80 percent is the manner in which you observe the presence of the speaker. So, these skills are important. Let us see one by one how these skills come through. Verbal communication when we are talking about we have mainly four skills which we need to improve. Even if our skills are very good, let us remember that there is no limit to improvement. I cannot say that you know my skill is good therefore, I should not improve. Life is a long process of improvement and where you are today depends on where you will be tomorrow or after 5 years. You have to begin the process from where you are today. Suppose you are at 80 percent, all you need is 20 percent. Suppose you are at 20 percent, what you need is 80 percent. But very often we get very disheartened by saying, I am not good enough. You know, especially when it comes to English, I find my students saying, we are not really good enough. So what? Don't you think improving 80 percent is much more exciting than improving 20 percent? So I would rather we had less skills because we have an exciting life of improvement. But if we have less skills and we do not improve, there is no excitement. The idea is that even if I am terrible, I can start the process of improvement today and go on. Starting with the listening skill. All of us listen, most of us listen very passively. We listen either to agree or to disagree. We never listen to generate ideas. We never listen to take initiative and start something new. Look at the manner in which this young man used to listen. One day in the room of his master, he heard Sri Ramakrishna say that if you want to serve people, you can't do it. Suppose you want to help a person, it is not possible. Who are you to help? After all, you are another human being. Help a person as though you are worshipping God. You know, with that kind of dedication, with that kind of commitment and loyalty, which you would bring to a worship of, you know, whatever deity you believe in, whatever religion you believe in. So, this he heard. There were many people in the room who heard it. Naren was one of the boys who heard what others also heard. But he established an entire organization which is doing this all over the world today and that is the Ramakrishna Mat and the Ramakrishna Mission. So, what is it that is specific in his hearing? What is so special about his hearing which others do not have? And that is by hearing a small thing, he could develop it into an entire idea for life itself you know for a whole process of uh, you know improving or social reform or whatever you feel like calling it. Just by listening to a small three four words as a mantra. Now, when you sit down to listen in your classes, when you listen to your friends, your elders, your youngsters, your parents or teachers, how much of this gets you know really imbibed? How much of it comes out as something like a banyan tree, a small seed growing into a huge tree? That is the kind of listening we have to inculcate. You have a ready-made forum for practice today because I am going to do all the talking and you are listening. Now, does this listening only come to the surface of your mind or does it go somewhere which begins an active listening process? While listening, your mind is also thinking as to what I know about this, what I can do with this and what I do not need at all in this. So, that is one. Then speaking, you know, like all of us, Vivekananda felt very, uh, very uh, uh, scared to speak in, the, in front of an audience, English speaking audience that too. He said, I have never spoken to an English speaking audience which is thousands and thousands of people. 
Some say it was 4000, some say it was 7000, we do not really know how many were there on the first day when he was speaking, 11 September 1893, the parliament of religions in Chicago. He stood up to speak and every time his name was called, he would say not now, not now, not now. He was scared, obviously like us, not a great leader, you know. But then when he spoke, if you look at the newspapers of 12th September, you will find coverage of Vivekananda's speech more than the others. They spell his name wrongly. They give many facts which are not correct, but they all agree that he spoke well. This comes only with wholehearted commitment and practice to speaking. Whatever we cannot do, we need to practice more. If you can speak very well, then you do not need to practice it so much as when you do not know how to speak. But what do we do? We practice what we know very well. You know, suppose you in one subject you are very good. You do only that, you do not do anything else. Therefore, our aim here is now how to improve our speaking. What are the various aspects of speaking which we like? Clarity in what we are saying clarity in what we are thinking, always keeping the audience in mind, even the audience is one person, we always speak for the other person, we do not speak for ourselves. Suppose I want to please myself, then I jolly well sit in my own room and speak. Why should I come all the way to your place, to your university and then speak? The only reason is that I would like to speak to you, I have to keep you in mind. This is how Vivekananda spoke when he said, sisters and brothers of America, this is what he was doing. He was empathizing with his audience. He was participating with his audience. He was trying to get into the mind of the audience. Once you do this, you will find your fluency, your accuracy, your sophistication of speaking becomes much better because after all, the audience is paramount. Reading also, you know, we do so much reading. As students, you read so much. But most of us do a whole lot of mechanical reading. I find my students appearing for GMAT, GRE, they know thousands of words in English, they can mark the correct answer, their meanings, etc. In real life, they don't know how to use it because they studied like parrots, not like human beings. They never learnt anything. It seems Vivekananda used to borrow one book from a library per day, that is the example I gave you, and return the book the next day. After a few days, librarian got very irritated by saying, who is this fellow who keeps borrowing one book every day and returning the next day? Does not he like to read? Then the person who used to get the book went and told, Swamiji, why do you want me to get one book every day? It is very embarrassing, you know. Please read the books. Swamiji said, Please tell the librarian that I read it and I remember. She can have a quiz any day she wants. And I can answer any question from any of the books. Some of the books might have been 500 pages. Imagine the kind of mind which reads like that. Not a surfacial reading. You know, the human eye is like a photographic camera. You can record anything in the brain head top computer, you know, God given free. You do not have to pay many thousands to buy it. With thousands and thousands of GB space lying empty. Vivekananda was filling that space. You know, this computer has limited GB. This computer has unlimited GB. How many? I can't tell you. But what is in it? Nothing. Here is one man who is telling us how those files and folders can be filled with information can be filled with knowledge, can be filled with ideas which can be used. Coming from reading, listening and reading are the skills for developing ourselves. Speaking and writing are the skills where we exhibit our communication. You can read Vivekananda, you know, nine volumes are there. You can read how much he has spoken and written. Now, for the 150th year, Advaita Ashram has brought out a reader, Vivekananda reader, I was showing it to boys who came to my room yesterday. A small, out of nine volumes, they have taken only 
significant things and brought out, you know, 200 pages, which I think each one of you can possess to read for the rest of your life, not necessary to read now. Maybe one page every day, one page every month or every year, something like that, it goes on and on. So these are skills which you need to think about. How are my verbal skills? Can I improve? I have given you some examples from Vibhanda. Since most of these ideas we get from English speaking countries, their vocabulary is interesting. You know? So they put using the word see, they have put four important areas which we can use for judging our communication. You are doing an excellent fluent verbal communication. You are doing wonderful writing. Your listening and reading also have improved. But when you communicate, do you have these three things? So not only is it a self-improvement program, but it is also a program for self-assessment. You know, constantly we are our own teachers. We test ourselves. For students, this is very exciting, you know. Your teachers tell you one day that for this semester exam, we are not going to set any papers. Please set your own question papers. Won't you feel excited? Oh, I can set my own paper and take to the exam hall. It's very interesting. I'll set pa the paper and take. I go to the exam hall and answer the paper which I have set. The examiner says, please don't give up your papers. You correct it yourself. More excitement. Oh, wow. I can correct my own papers. Then I'll give myself 100. So what? Nobody is correcting it. Nobody is looking at it. You know, our whole life is spent in somebody policing us, somebody telling us what is right or, you know, evaluating us. Self-improvement programs don't do that. To get yourself skill-oriented, you have to be your own teacher, your own examiner or your own evaluator and you have to be very strict with yourself. So when you are measuring your communication skills, check up if you have Clarity, correctness, conciseness and courtesy. These four aspects should be the you know, yardsticks for your measuring your communication. Clarity. Many of us say many things. Remember that you are trying to help somebody from that a quarrel arises. Very often quarrels come from well-meaning advice. What happened? There was no clarity in your communication. You said something, the other person understood something else. You can't blame the person who misunderstood you. Although we always say, you know, I'm an English teacher, so I have worry about words. We don't say miscommunication. We don't say misspeaking. We say misunderstanding. Always blame is on others, you know, pointing finger like that. But that is not correct at all. You know, if we communicate with clarity, then only understanding is possible. Our communication is not clear. We cannot blame the other person for misunderstanding. Misunderstanding is not. Communication is always coded and this code has to be known by both the people. The moment that code is not known, you won't have any communication. It is like the red light, you know, when we see red light at the signal, we know it means stop. But today, you know, in traffic in Hyderabad is bad, I don't know about Kanpur, nobody knows the meaning of red and green. The right is red, they are all going across, as though it's looking green to them. Either they are colorblind, they can't differentiate between red and green, or they don't know red means stop and green means go, isn't it? Are they willfully breaking the rules? What is it that we are trying to communicate? So it is like this. All our communication is symbolic. It has to have clarity. So from today, when you are listening to somebody, please evaluate on a scale of 1 to 10 how clear that communication is. When you are speaking, again evaluate on a scale of 1 to 10 how clear it is. When you are writing and reading, do the same. You know, some passages you read are so obscure, some are so clear. 
this helps communication. So, constant attempt at evaluation, clarity. I have quoted the words of Vivekananda, which you can read, I won't go into them. This quotation tells us about clarity. You know, these are all very abstruse concepts, divine, manifested and nature and all these words are tough. But look at the way in which he has put it. You know, all those big words he has reduced to an equation, help others. The only way to get divine nature manifested in you, such a tough sentence, reducing it simply with great clarity is to help others to get the same thing. So, if you in a crowded bus stand up and give somebody a seat, divine is manifested, where are you searching for God? God is there where you have helped somebody. You can't see God sitting far away in heaven. Every time you do a good deed, there God is present. But that is such a difficult philosophy. So he puts it, help others. You know, look at the kind of clarity which immediately we can measure. Then correctness. You know, correctness implies putting a factual dimension to what we are saying. Very often our factual dimensions are themselves in doubt. We use a variety of double speak when we are you know talking. This is not what gives you correctness. So again, a you know very significant story is there in Vivekananda's life, which I am sure many people would have told you, and that is the story of his meeting monkeys in Banaras. Do you know? So I won't repeat it. So, from there comes this correctness, face the brute. Somebody told Vivekananda, why are you running away? Face the brute. He did it. Imagine the result he got is that the monkeys ran away. Correctness. You give from factual data and the result of the factual data is the right response comes. So, what we find is that Vivekananda faced the brute and he got, you know, they ran away. This is what does not happen in our communication very often. We say something, we do not say it with conviction. We say something, we find the result does not come. Suppose I say I will help you. Simple, I will help you. Tomorrow when I see you anywhere near me, I run from another road because I do not really want to help you. I said, you know, very impressively, and very speciously, I told you, I'll help you. But actually, I don't want to do it. How much correctness is there in what we are saying? This is a question again, which needs your evaluation. Constantly think of yourself. Are you saying things which are correct? Are you saying things which you will follow through? Can you do what you're saying? If you cannot, then it's not good communication to say it at all. You promise somebody that you will do this or do that. You promise somebody you will do it in this time or that time. This is violated very often. You know, Indian standard time is very often interpreted as Indian stretchable time. Obviously. So, you can imagine how communication requires correctness. Then conciseness. Again, I have quoted from Vivekananda. Strength is life, weakness is death. He put in such an aphoristic, you know, such a pithy statement, a statement which can be expanded into hundreds and hundreds of lines, hundreds of pages. You can go on and on and on writing, strength is life. We can write a story, we can write a novel, we can write an essay on this. Weakness is death. Vivekananda himself has elaborated this in, you know, many places in the complete works. But look at this, concise. Very often we do not want to say what we mean. We keep beating around the bush, saying a whole lot of things without saying what we want. This, you know, in some cases it is wonderful. You have to be very concise. But in, um, you have to be very elaborate, but in some cases it is not. Now, in engineering colleges, usually you have something called as the, you know, campus interviews. 
there somebody asks you, the interviewer asks you, please talk about yourself. The candidate usually says a name and qualification and keeps quiet. What you're being asked is, tell us in what areas we should question you. So you must give your entire academic profile, your professional capabilities, your achievements, not who your parents are, etc. You know, that is conciseness there. You are saying something which you shouldn't. You go for a dinner party, you know, there nobody wants to know about you. Hello, who are you? You give your whole life story. People get bored. They say, why are you doing such a thing? You were never asked to say who you are and so on. You just say, hello, I'm so and so. Not more than that. Where you are expected to elaborate, you give only one sentence. Where you are expected to give one sentence, you gave a whole introduction. See, I'm a very big man, you know, I'm very important. Let me tell you, nobody wants to know. In a context where you require to be brief, you are elaborate. In a context where you're supposed to be elaborate, you're brief. This ability to discern, this ability to, you know, choose, discriminate becomes important for communication. Then we have courtesy. This is very important for all people who speak to each other. You know, if I go to speak to my boss, I hold my hands like this and I keep doing like that. Yes, sir, whatever you say, sir, and so on. When I go to my room and I want to call the pune, the pune might be 10 years older to me in age, my boss might be 5 years younger to me in age. Very important is that whoever we speak to deserves some respect. Unless we have that humility in us, we cannot speak. Again, I have quoted from Swamiji, each soul is potentially divine. We don't see, you know, our greeting is so wonderful. When we say Namaste, we are greeting that soul. You know, when we are say Adavarze, we are saying that may God be with you. This greeting, this wonderful exchange, we never think about. That is why we lose courtesy. Suppose you've invited me to speak and I come and tell you, see how useless you are? You had to get me to speak from, you know, to, uh, thousands of kilometers away. Will anybody listen to me? You are great in your own way. Your experience is very valuable, which I don't have. You know, there are many qualifications in you, which I don't have. I don't know how to do it. Then how is it that I can talk down to you? None of us can talk down to anybody. This is important for communication. Now we come to non-verbal. Non-verbal communication, as I told you, is very important. Every day we look at ourselves in the mirror. Do we? You know, I say, oh, today I'm not looking so nice. Today I'm looking very nice, you know. Today nothing can be better than what I'm looking. Today is real bad. I don't even feel like going out. How much importance we give to our physical appearance, which is only a genetic accident, isn't it? Our physical appearance, we couldn't choose. We don't have any control over it. What we have control over is the manner in which this biological being is being projected outside. A small smile, a simple handshake, a neutral expression, these are all which are available with us. So non-verbal communication becomes significant. I'm not going into great details of non-verbal communication. I would just like you to learn by observing yourself and others. For your observation, I have put the popular picture of Vivekananda here. I've used many pictures of Vivekananda because when you keep such an ideal in front of your eyes, you know, when you see not only in your mind, then you might get wonderful ideas. You might get real original ideas which help you to improve. That is the point here. So Vivekananda here standing with hands folded with a facial expression which shows you his great self-confidence. 
So the body, the face, the posture, the gesture, everything becomes significant. For instance, we have to choose which kind of a body language is important for which situation. Whenever we teach kinesics, you know, it will take two, three hours to teach. We teach our students that, you know, eye contact is very important. So when you're talking to a person, please look at that person. Now, eye contact is not very good in all situations. Your director or your principal calls you to scold you. <laughs> you, look, you keep looking at that person. That, Don't look at me. Look down. Why are you looking at me? No, you know, our soft skills teacher told us <laughs> eye contact. Wouldn't you choose what is right? The police are asking you a question. You keep looking here and there. They say, you know, now the... the Professor scolded me, so let me look like this. It seems the police will arrest you if you don't look at them and answer. Because they think if you are not looking at them, you are telling lies. Now you have to choose. You have to find out which is correct and which. Posture in India, you know, we generally keep our hands together because that's our culture. If you go to the US and if you, you know, if I speak like this, they think I'm very wooden. They will expect me to, you know, move my arms around and, you know, keep making facial expressions. Without uttering a single word, they will change their facial expression many times. Indians, they say, you are, you know, very, very neutral. Why is it that your gestures and your facial expressions are so neutral? So you might be working in a global situation, like Vivekananda went all over the world. You need to change your non-verbal communication according to the situation where you are. By looking at the various postures of great people, you can find that, you know, it is wonderful. If you see Gandhiji, you know, walking like that, frail man, old man, walking with two people to support him. I find on the campus many young boys holding each other. Not necessary, you haven't become 80 yet. That gives a negative, you know, kind of sex, non-verbal. Today, you remember that the world misunderstands friendship between single gender people also. So you don't want that kind of miscommunication when you're holding your, you know, two boys are holding each other and going, or two, two girls are holding hands and going. Non-verbal communication is a very significant determiner of personality. Therefore, whenever you look at somebody, look at what you can admire. Youngsters love watching movies. You know, next time you go to a movie, don't pay attention to the dress of the hero or the, you know, songs or picturization, etc. Look at their non-verbal skills. An actor is given great training in non-verbal communication. We can learn these things. Although movie is entertaining, it is also life-changing. We need not say movies are terrible, so, you know, we should avoid. Television serials are horrible because nothing happens. The story is not important at all for us. What is important are these small pointers where we can learn something. So, kinesics. Then we come to proxemics. I have put the picture of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda because this is a very good example of proximity. Two aspects of proxemics we must remember. One is the physical and the other is psychological. I'll give you a simple example. People who are around us, you know, relatives, friends, etc., we don't have any time for them. If guests come to my house, I say, shall we watch television? You know, they came to speak to me. Unfortunately, I'm making them watch television, which they could have watched in their own house. Instead, I pick up my cell phone and speak for one hour to a person who is maybe in UK or US or Germany. So what are we doing? We are defining kinesics in different ways. So are you comfortable closeness, you know, physical closeness side by side? You know, whenever a speaker comes, you give an elevated platform. 
elevated platform here becomes respect. You know, because we respect you, you are standing on top. Suppose I want to stand there and speak, I am bridging some kind of gap of kinesics. I am giving a redefinition to, um, sorry, proxemics. The proximity item becomes important. The other is the psychological proximity. You know, physical proximity, I have given an example of the first meeting of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. Vivekananda was a young college boy like any of you, went to this man who people told him was exceptional. So, Ramakrishna took him aside and he touched him because he had asked a question that can you show me what God is? This is the question he asked. So, Ramakrishna said, come I will show you. The moment he touched him, you know proximity, he felt as though the whole world was dissolving, as though he was losing his limited personality, as though his personality was getting merged into the cosmic personality into the cosmic intelligence. He got scared. He said, am I dying? Is this how it feels to die? I have parents. Please cure me. Please cure me. Again, Ramakrishna touched him. He became normal. Normal means a limited existence. Once this limited existence goes away, what we call meditation, etc., you know, that we be it becomes unlimited. So, this is the idea which we find in this physical uh, you know, touch. Many of us crave for physical touch. If you have done a wonderful, you know, result or a wonderful achievement, then people come and pat you. You know, your teacher comes and pats you and says, wonderful, great, we congratulate by shaking hands. Sometimes people only use words, then you say, why didn't they congratulate me by touching me? You know, by making me feel that comfort. Look at proxemics also in our greetings. You know, India except Kanpur in winter, India is a warm country. We are constantly sweating, so we don't like to touch each other. We say namaste from far away. If you go to a cold country where you know their summer is like Kanpur winter, they keep hugging each other. That is their greeting. In India, we never hug each other. We hardly ever come within touching distance of each other proximity, physical proximity culturally determined. Then of course, psychological proximity. When you are writing your examination, you know in the exam hall, some invigilator comes and looks at your paper. Immediately you cover your paper. That is the same teacher who is going to correct your answers. But you say, do not come anywhere near me when I am writing my exam. When I give my paper, it belongs to you. Till I give it, it belongs to me. Proxemics, don't you have in your real life all the time? You know, again I gave you one example for psychological proximity, where at Ramakrishna's deathbed, he tells, you know, that I have transmitted my power into your power. Ramakrishna selected Vivekananda as a leader for his organization. He said, this is a boy who has the capability of being a leader. So, what did he do? He gave, he said that, you know, my achievements for 50 years of my life, now I am transferring to you. This is what all of us do. You know, when you are organizing a program like this, I am sure you have been transferring each other's knowledge and skills and capabilities to each other. There must be at least 20, 30 people organizing, each one looking at a different aspect. Or if you are organizing, you know, a festival in the campus, you can't do it individually, you have to do it collectively. And collective implies sharing. This sharing at the psychological level is what is most important. You know, we get better by what is called as vicarious experience. Vicarious is not our own, but somebody else's. This experience is the most valuable concept of learning. So, we have to now check up our verbal and non-verbal communication by keeping these parameters in mind. We always measure ourselves, don't we? If we are becoming very fat, we measure our weight. Am I becoming very fat? Let me see. If you have blood pressure, you have another instrument. We don't have an instrument for measuring our skills. Soft skills, no instrument. 
these are providing you with the instruments they are providing you you with the scale of measurement how much you become better or how much you learn depends on you i might talk about skills does it mean my skills are very good please don't make that mistake it is not i have to keep measuring my skills all the time to see whether i'm becoming better whether I, my skills are in place or i can improve and so on four objectives of communication whenever we communicate verbally or non verbally mainly verbally these are the four things we need to keep in mind the basic level of communication is only to give information sharing of information slightly more or higher or more involved communication is to persuade your listener persuasion and information are only a single one sided communication to be more involved you know where the audience is also involved in the communication we call it as negotiation you know both participate and both come to a conclusion and then you have the highest level of communication somebody who you are talking to or somebody who is talking to you can that person inspire you this is the highest level of communication all our verbal and of course very often non verbal also should be aiming towards the inspiring communication our words our gestures our very presence should make others feel as though this is something that's wonderful worth emulating you know this is wonderful worth watching and seeing therefore i've given of course some examples of each of them i hope you will read the examples yourself because we don't have much time i will go on with your permission of course to the next point because these are some of the things i had to say about communication communication needs to be improved constantly a skill is something which we acquire easily and we lose equally easily today because i speak a lot my skill is developed if i don't speak for a long time i will lose the skill when i was your age i could write exams very well you know in our ma exam 40 sheets of paper in 3 hours was just child's play for us today if you ask me to write two sentences i keep searching for the keyboard i don't feel like taking up my pen anymore that skill which was there with me 30 years back is not there with me today so one can acquire and one can lose the only thing for us is to have the skill to that measure or to that amount which is necessary for us at that point of time today i don't need to write an exam so i don't need that skill anymore let me have those skills which i need similarly each one of you individually choose those skills which you want to improve and go on improving them because life is only a you know story of progress a story of improvement if we sit back and say oh i've arrived then it is like dead the doctors use a term called brain dead brain dead means finished nothing can be done but they don't declare fully dead they call it brain dead but now in soft skills we are giving a new definition to this brain dead is a person who's not capable of learning who's not capable of improving whose mind is fossilized you know whose mind has become completely closed and then we don't improve there is no limit to the kind of improvement which we can do but the choice is ours you know we have to understand that how much and in what direction depends only on us this session i told you we had two things to do one is uh, verbal non verbal which i did i hope i did it that come you know you only you have to tell me whether i did or i didn't and now we are moving to leadership and team skills because the leader always has a team and the team always has a leader therefore we are taking them together i started off by giving you the definition of leadership now again let me remind you i'm repeating myself very often because teachers have this habit you know you can't change our bad habits self improvement is by choosing 
what you want. Every one of us needs to be a leader, not a leader like the Prime Minister or Chief Minister. I'm not talking about that leadership. I'm talking about leadership as being leaders of ourselves. Which direction are we going to go? That depends on what kind of a leader we are leading ourselves. So I would like each of one of us to test our own leadership skill, not leading others first, but leading ourselves. I'll tell you a simple example. A very brilliant young boy. This is a real story. Quite a few years back, of course. He wanted to, you know, since he was so brilliant, everybody said, why don't you, you know, study engineering, go to an IIT, which is supposed to be the destination for all intelligent students. So he got through the entrance, he got a sub wonderful rank, and he took admission in Madras IIT, close to Hyderabad. He studied there for a few months, then he came back home saying, I hate IIT, I hate engineering, I won't do it, and so on and so forth. Intelligent student. Intelligence does not mean skills, please understand. After doing his graduation in an ordinary course, he appeared for the entrance examination, qualified, got an excellent rank, and got a seat in IIM Ahmedabad. Good destination. You know, everybody who's doing BTEC would finally land up in one great B school or the other. Again studied for a couple of weeks, came back home and said, I hate I am, I hate the MBA, I hate this, I hate that and all. He became a maladjusted individual in life. God gave intelligence, you know, as far as his brain intelligence is concerned, he had lots of it. But as far as leading himself in the right direction is concerned, he didn't have. Therefore, look at the definition of leadership, the ability to conquer a context. Context is any situation in life. Conquering is to rise above the situation. You know, if you go to a new city, a new course, adjustment is essential. It is difficult. First few months in a campus like this might make you feel terrible, but you'll start loving it. So that by the end of the course, you don't want to leave the campus. A campus where you were so uncomfortable, today has become so wonderful for you. Ability to conquer a context. If you run away, nothing happens. Life in every day of our life brings hundreds of contexts like this. We are uncomfortable, we are unhappy, we are maladjusted, we are depressed. But the human mind has the ability to cure itself. The human mind has the ability to, you know, provide therapy for itself. You don't need any doctor or any outsider. But then you have to train your own mind to be that, that you know, therapist. Therefore, Vivekananda also, although a great leader, had a lot of difficulties in his life. I have listed a few of them, you know, how Vivekananda become, became a leader of himself. Even as a child, he was a great leader. You know, once they locked him up in a room because he used to keep giving off everything to the beggars. Context is very tough. He's locked up in a room. He can't give anything to a beggar. He was so generous even in childhood. So a beggar came and said, you know, I'm feeling so cold. I'm starving, this, that. Little Naren looked around the room. He found a nice new shawl. He took that shawl and he threw it out of the window. Context was difficult. Ability to conquer the context. He found around, he looked around, he found a shawl, he gave it to the beggar. The beggar went off praising him, but when the parents opened the room, they gave him a nice beating, saying, why did you give the new shawl away? These are, you know, endless examples in his life where more and more difficult contexts came. The ones which I have listed are only a few. His life is full of difficulties. If you read his letters, you know, sometimes he's writing letters which are so full of problems. But he didn't run away from America and come here because he said, by staying one more day in America, I'm getting a few more dollars for my Indian brothers. I'm getting money for the poor people. He never used to spend a single pesa on himself. 
You know, if you felt cold, somebody said, Swamiji, why don't you buy yourself a new sweater or a new cap? He said, how many dollars? No, no, I can't afford it. So many dollars for one new coat, it can feed a hundred for one month in my country. I can't afford it. So these are contexts which come. Now for you to become a leader, for me to become a leader, we have to analyze each experience in life. We have to remember that, you know, whenever any experience comes in our life, that experience deserves to be analyzed. All of us live life. When we are happy, we are happy. When we are sad, we are sad. We don't analyze. It is exactly like having an accident, it seems. God forbid. If any of us has an accident, the pain doesn't come immediately. You know, first we are in shock completely. After an hour or two, you realize that you've broken a bone and, you know, things like that. If blood comes out, okay, you know, immediately you're hurt. But suppose it is not obvious, then we never know. Experience is like that. When we are undergoing experience, we cannot evaluate it. Once the experience is over, you know, like the cow and calf, you know, they keep chewing the cud, it is called. They first eat quickly and then they, you know, keep chewing it for the rest of the day. Our experiences deserve that. Each experience for us is a valuable lesson. And this lesson comes to us when we remember the definition of leadership. That is, if we had a bad experience, that has a good lesson also. You know, suppose there is a failure in life, I have failed. Then there are two ways of responding to it. I say, since I failed, I am useless and my life is finished. Go and jump into, you know, there's a beautiful lake in Hyderabad called Tangband. Jump into Tangband, finished. The other is, I say, okay, I have failed. Does it mean I am capable of success? Then let me see how I will get success. Work harder and harder and harder till I get success. The context is the same. The response are two different. We cannot choose our experiences. We can choose our response to this experience. These make for wonderful contexts for us to draw our own map, you know. We also need a map for our own life. We need a blueprint. We are drawing using, by getting examples from Vivekananda. Since this is 150 years of Vivekananda, I am giving you examples of Vivekananda. You can take examples from any great life. You can make presentations like this on any great context. But the ultimate aim is not Vivekananda. As I told you, venerating Vivekananda is keeping him far away. Using him is what we want. You know, what we are looking for is what is called as pragmatics. The whole of 20th century was a very theoretical century. Today, 21st century is a century of pragmatics. We want everything to have some essence which comes to us. So we are taking the essence of Vivekananda through all this only because that essence improves the quality of our life. It improves the manner in which we live. After all, we are studying, we are working, we are living only to have some good quality of life. If Vivekananda can give it to us, I'm happy with him. If Vivekananda can't give it to us, Vivekananda is useless for me. Then I don't want him. So using the context of Vivekananda, we are looking towards it. The final ultimate analysis is that when you have an experience starting today for the rest of your life, are you going to analyze your experience? Are you going to see whether it, you have conquered the experience or the experience has conquered you? Is the experience suppressing you or are you above the experience? This is what is important. Again, to measure a person, whether the person has qualities of leadership or not, these are your scales. Now, I'm giving some kind of measurement now. Eight of them, I think, are there in two slides continuously, one after another. Innovation, willpower, courage, and discipline. I have given once more, as I told you, examples from Vivekananda. Innovation, you know, when he said that I want to have an organization in the na name of my master, 
everybody laughed at him saying what is this foolish fellow he hasn't got a job he hasn't got money he has no ancestral property he want to set up an organization so they took off the house also the house where sri ramakrishna passed away beautiful big house you all can see if you go to kolkata any time it's called you know uh, the kashipur baganbadi or it is called the garden house of kosipur this house they were living in he said go go this is very expensive house we can't pay they went and took for rent a house where everybody said there are ghosts the house was never rented you know because there were ghosts nobody was coming so these young boy in their 20s they said okay rent is very low let us go and stay that is how the order began that is how the organization began today any part of the world you go you find ramakrishna mat or ramakrishna mission you know you go to us you are feeling very lonely you look around you say okay ramakrishna mat is here let me go and visit they are called vedanta centers there mainly so these are all you know it's like one whole close knit family which started with the innovation of this person then of course will power will power he used to keep saying many of us plan many thing we have huge plans execution is difficult i'm sure shubhadeep can tell us the difference between planning and executing one fine day he got an idea let us do a program for 6 days but then how much struggle to bring it out that is will power you know midway we give up you make a big plan that i want to do this 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 then after some time you say oh really do i want to do it you know it's like the first day when you start studying or when you join a job it's so exciting people study hard for 3 years 5 years get into the civil services ias the highest you know most powerful job after 5 years they come and tell me oh it's a terrible job you know and now i want to leave my friends who are in ips ifs they tell me you did a wonderful thing by choosing to become professor we were foolish to go into the civil services it is not the job which is good or bad it is your will power you know somebody might say teaching is horrible why should i teach usmani university campus is now like a war zone it's so much confusion so much battle so much fighting but it's all will power if i'm doing this let me do it till i complete it if i have committed to this let me complete what i have committed to holding on to the will you know the mind is like a monkey vivekananda gives a huge analogy you know a monkey which is drunken a monkey which is mad a monkey which is looking at a mirror many analogies this is from indian philosophy itself but this mind monkey is in your control you are the one holding the control and it is you who have to improve therefore will power is how much you can motivate yourself you know when people are writing resumes these days i keep coming across highly motivated self motivated they don't even know what it means because motivation levels are usually very low suppose tomorrow is an exam tonight you sleep with your alarm clock tomorrow morning 4 o'clock i'm going to get up and revise this 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 the alarm rings when you put the alarm your motivation was 100% when the alarm rings at 4 o'clock 5 minutes only 5 minutes you switch off the alarm when you wake up you're young there is no harm in sleeping you know sleep is very important you realize it's 8 o'clock because the 5 minutes became 4 hours only time for the exam no time for revising imagine within the space of you know 6 to 8 hours your motivation came from 100 to 0 will power you get up you jump up and you start reading your motivation is there imagine in a cold morning to get up at 4 and read requires a lot of will power on a sunday to sit here and listen to me requires a lot of will power isn't it you could be doing other things you're sitting here because you have will power all of us have how to use it how much to use it you know there's a difference between stubbornness and will power i won't go into that courage 
Again, I gave example of, you know, Chicago. Chicago, he, if you read his biography, you'll find he keeps praying from morning he's praying. Why did I come to Chicago? Why am I sitting here? Why should I speak? All of them are speaking well. I can't speak. All this he's saying. Every time they call his name, he's saying no. Finally, they told him that, Vivekananda, if you don't speak now, your name will be cut off. He said, ah, I have come from India to speak. It will be so embarrassing if I don't speak. So, Mother Saraswati, please help me. Sri Ramakrishna, my master, please help me. Then he went and stood like this. You saw that posture, you know, folded hands posture. And he started speaking. So, you can imagine that these things required a lot of courage. Going to America itself, because everybody told him they would excommunicate him. In those days, going to America was, you know, your, you will be removed from your jati. The jati was only in India. If you cross the sea, finished, lost. So this, in spite of all that, he went. In spite of every criticism, he lived. And then discipline, you know, there is a story about somebody asking him, that, can you teach me Swamiji? Because if you go to Swamiji, you always say good things. Swamiji, can you teach me Bhagavad Gita? Swamiji looked at that boy and said, can you go and play some football and come? He was shocked. He said, what kind of a Swamiji is this? I'm asking for Bhagavad Gita and he's saying football. What Swamiji meant is that, you know, we have holistic health. If your body is so thin, emaciated, and you know, you don't have physical discipline, then you can never have mental discipline to understand Bhagavad Gita. We cannot neglect the body for the mind. We cannot neglect the mind for the body. You know, look at the scientists who are discovering all the uh, biological and chemical weapons. Powerful intellect, but no discipline. Look at the villains in our movies. You know, huge muscles, no mind. <laughs> Therefore, we need holistic balance. You know, your body should be good, strong, powerful. Your mind should be good, strong, powerful. Otherwise, it is not discipline. So the story of the Bhagavad Gita and the football, you know, is a very interesting story in the life of uh, Vivekananda. Now we come to the remaining four uh, traits. Of course, time is so short and we started a little late that, yeah, I won't give you time to interact, to ask questions, etc. But please take my phone number and my email ID from Shubhadeep and keep in touch with me for the rest of my life. Okay, not the rest of your life because you're very young. <laughs> I'm available to you for the rest of my life. You know, no speaker who speaks to you can be so unaccountable. I speak maybe to 500 people every week. I give my email and my phone number to everybody. People think I'm crazy. Say, why do you give? Remember, nobody calls up unless they have something to say. You know, we have Ramakrishna Mat there has something called Vivekananda Institute of Human Excellence. Earlier I used to go regularly. Now, of course, I don't have time. One lecture which I took on interpersonal skills, after six months, one girl saw me in, you know, we have a bus stop called Secondrabad Station. I was sitting in the bus stop waiting for a bus. One young girl comes and says, Madam, didn't you speak at such and such a place on such and such a month? Now I have a question. In the class, she never asked a question. Six months later, she asked a question. That is really wonderful, you know. Because now if you ask me, it will only be very intellectual questions. You listen, you understand, you ask me. But what I want you to ask is experiential questions. You listen, you practice, then you ask. You can tell me whatever you said is all rubbish. But please tell me after a few months. Don't tell me just now. Because after a few months you would have practiced. Then you said, yes, what you said works or what you said doesn't work. In either case, you feel like getting in touch and telling me about it. Okay, so please feel free. I will try to finish exactly by uh, 12. We have a small break, it seems, at 12. And then 12.30 uh, we resemble. Whatever, you know, the organizers can tell me. 
Now I am like a puppet, you know. The string is in their hands. So if you are not getting your tea, you can't blame me. It is you have to blame them. If you are not getting your break, you can't blame me. Anyway, let's continue. Four more points, which I thought there are many qualities for leadership. But when you are measuring yourself, measure, do I have courage? You know, in a particular situation, your courage is needed. Do I have innovation? Do I have discipline? You, who can tell better than you? In front of others, we can pretend to be better than we are. In front of ourselves, we can't pretend. We can't lie to ourselves. You know, the police have a machine called the lie detector. But please remember that the lie detector doesn't work unless the person cooperates. This is the police officers. You know, once there was a workshop for police officers. I was asking them varieties of questions and I got this information from them. That no lie detector works because the only person you can't hide from is yourself. You can hide from a lie detector, you can hide from anybody else but not from yourself. So measuring our own leadership capabilities by seeing whether we have these traits adequately or too much or too little and so on. Initiative, commitment, humility and concentration, four more traits. I just, you know, casually listed all the possible traits. Some examples are given here. Today, not only Ramakrishna Math, but we have what is called as Sharada Math, women's organization, completely autonomous. There are many women's, uh, you know, nunneries all over the world. But all of them are controlled at some point or the other by the monasteries, that is the male organ. For instance, we have Roman Catholic, you know, all of us studied in convent. So we have Roman Catholic convents. But finally, ultimately, the Pope is always a man. I've never seen a Pope who's a woman. Look at this man's initiative in the 19th century where Indian women never came out of the houses. He said that we must have a women's organization, autonomous women's organization. No, you know, control by saying in a patriarchal society where we say that men are to control everything. Here was a man who was saying that no, they have equal ability to control themselves. This kind of original idea is what we call initiative, what others are not doing. Life goes, you know, life becomes better when real thinkers can take initiative. I'm sure great leaders are sitting in the room today, but you're all potential leaders. You will become leaders by giving importance to the ideas which come to your mind. It is called as the courage of convictions. All of us have convictions, but we are scared of our convictions. We think, what will others say? But courage, I think like this and I will execute. This was of course done much later, much after Vivekananda's death. Last month I was speaking in Kolkata in one of their colleges, Sharadamat colleges, wonderful campus, wonderful college and I was amazed at what achievement can come by a simple word, a simple dream of Vivekananda and that is having a special organization for women. Then commitment. In the various relationships I have mentioned, he was, you know, totally committed. Whatever he took up, he was totally committed. Once there was a poor friend who wanted to write a book on music. He was not so good as Vivekananda. Vivekananda was also very well versed in music. So he said, you need money by selling this book. Don't worry, I'll write it for you. He took the book and he wrote a treatise on music and he published it in the friend's name. The royalty came to the friend. Look at the kind of commitment he had. You know, he used to, when his father died, he used to come home and tell the mother, today I have eaten and come. You'll eat, whatever is available, you'll eat. He hadn't eaten. He would starve, he would take a glass of water and sleep because he knew there was little food for his younger brothers and sisters. If he shared, there would be no food. This is the kind of love which he had, the commitment which he had, the kind of tears he shed for poor people. You know, today we think that the poor people only have to be given welfare schemes. No welfare scheme helps a poor person as much as the real commitment which you feel towards them. 
when our leaders start feeling real commitment, then the real you know, benefit will come to the poor people. Humility, I already spoke to you about humility when I was speaking about courtesy in communication. So here a similar thing. You know, he used to say that I have, you know, he never became the president of the order. He said, I don't have the qualities of running an organization. I can plan an organization, I can't run it. Like Gandhiji never became the prime minister or president. He got us freedom and he left it at that. What humility these people had. Similarly, he used to, you know, never go when people were organizing anything. He would sit in his room. They would say, Swamiji, can't you come and check up how we are arranging, how we are doing? He said, no. If I see somebody doing wrong, I will shout at them. That person will feel hurt. So I will sit quietly. I will come when every arrangement is finished. Then I will only praise you by saying, oh, it's so wonderful. I don't want to get, you know. So these are qualities he knew about himself, that he had these problems. And then, of course, concentration. He gave a lot of importance to the mind and he developed concentration. It seems as a child he used to play games of concentration. Many stories are there. He would make all the entire team sit with eyes closed. He would sit still. The others would keep scratching themselves, moving their hands and legs. Here was young Narain sitting completely still because he said, when your mind is still only, your body can be still. You know, sometimes you're sitting in a room, you have a pen with you, you keep doing on and off, on and off to the pen. That means mind is disturbed, not body. Sometimes we keep, you know, moving. When you're studying for an exam, you keep, you know, moving like that. That means the mind is worried, the mind is anxious. The bodily movements are always the movements of the mind. So concentration, complete stillness of mind complete, you know, capability. You can develop your mental capabilities hugely by this. But Jen, just to talk about concentration will take five, six hours. I don't have that kind of time. Let us come now to team skills. A small picture of Vivekananda's team I have put there. <coughs> In those days there was not much technology, you know. It's a very, very faded picture. Not very clear, but these are the people who started the organization which has become so huge today. So this was his team. He identified each one who can do what and gave that work to the person. This kind of a, you know, divide, uh, dividing the correct work to the correct member is very important in team skills. The moment the leader feels, I am the best, I am the greatest, and all of you are less than me, that team doesn't work. That is why I have given you, of course, five ideas. One of them is to build an empowered team. Each member of the team is actually a leader. Each member of the team is individually capable. Only when the leader thinks like that, that you know more than me, you are better than me in this work, such a team doesn't, you know, ever fail. Suppose you keep suspecting your team members, you keep, you know, you don't have enough faith in your team members, then that is not a good team. There were 12 people in this first team which Vivekananda made and each of them were given special training by Ramakrishna. I'll give you one example. It's just 12 now. I'll take another five minutes. Are you okay? Comfortable? Okay. Does it make sense what I'm saying? All right. So should I continue for another five minutes? When you get bored, you have to tell me. You know, being polite is not useful at all. Okay. Please tell me. So Ramakrishna used to give training to everybody, you know, because he was making the future leaders. One day, one boy came and one of the disciples came and told him, that master, I had gone to the market, but I couldn't buy what you asked me to buy. Why, child, why couldn't you buy? The master asked. Then he said, you know, in the shop, everybody was saying bad things about you. They were saying, that fellow is mad, he's, why is he, he's crazy, he's spoiling the youngsters, he's a terrible person and so on. I felt very bad that they are cursing my guru, therefore I came away. The master got upset. He said, 
you love your guru they were saying bad things about your guru but you didn't protest you just came away you should have protested strongly you should have said this is not correct and you should have defended me then only you are a right disciple there were room full of disciples they all heard this said okay very good another disciple was going across you know you have to cross the ganges to come to the other side where the temple is so he, he was coming to meet ramakrishna in a boat in the middle of the ganges very deep river in the boat somebody was saying bad things about ramakrishna in his lifetime people said many bad things about him so this disciple remembered that earlier story he said master said always protest he stood up in the boat and he said now i am going to sink this boat and kill all of you stop saying immediately they got scared they stopped he came with great pride and he told the master you know master today they were saying bad things about you in the boat and i said i'll sink the boat and kill all of them again the master was unhappy he said no you didn't do the right thing why that day you told that you you know anybody says bad things about you we should protest he said that on the boat there were many people one or two people were saying bad things about me you should have told them not to say but you shouldn't have threatened to sink the boat which would have killed many others so you should not have done such a thing so uh, to an aggressive devotee he was saying don't be aggressive to a mild disciple he was saying don't be so mild so much mildness is not good so much aggression is not good like that he would give training so each person has some qualities in them when you form a team as a leader choose what is excellent in that person and encourage that which is excellent that is how an empowered team comes suppose you are doing project work five of you are in a team how will you empower the team that is what find out first who has which capability who has what to do then use the best abilities of each to strengthen the team <coughs> this doesn't happen when you see somebody is doing very well you feel jealous are i am the leader that person is doing much better than me tomorrow that person will want to become the leader so let me suppress you take away that part of the project and says no 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 you need not do this i'll give it to somebody else you're maintaining the website somebody is only giving the visuals for the website you say oh these visuals are excellent i won't give that person to make visuals are you not destroying your website by not giving the best most capable person you say no you do something else you do the text visuals somebody else will do text is bad because he doesn't know visuals are bad because the other person doesn't know you are destroying your own team by not allowing their strengths to come a real potential of teamwork develops when you have this kind of freedom in the team then you have you know include apparent misfits when you are organizing something or when you are working in a team especially once you finish your course and go into a job you'll have to do a lot of team work but you know you have to have many misfits in your team yesterday when i was waiting in the airport to take the flight to lucknow remember every experience is an education every experience is a learning experience two young people i think they are from the corporate offices somewhere in hyderabad they were talking to each other they saying you know our supervisor is useless he doesn't project us he gives work and he then he claims all the credit for the work mismanaged team i could immediately make out so i was going to team about speak about team skills today then immediately that incident comes to my mind that you know there the team is not very proper but then apparent misfits have to be tolerated in the team because who is apparent misfit and who is a real misfit we don't know suppose the supervisor is not good enough you keep doing your duty and the supervisor takes all the credit all you have to do is wait a little you know time management is a significant aspect of human life don't get impatient don't say he's a useless supervisor who doesn't give me credit maybe such a person has an other design 
such a person has something else. Let us give them a benefit of doubt for a little time. Of course, I couldn't give this advice to them because they would have felt, who is this person coming and telling us? But if I was in that situation, I would do that. I would give a benefit of doubt for some time. Then I would take some action. Nothing else to do here. Sometimes you think somebody is incapable. This is the weakest link in my team. That person becomes the most important person in your team after some time. This happens very, very often. If you watch the cricket match, you will find how team skills work. You know, apparently somebody got through the back door. You know, he said, this fellow should never have got a chance in the team. That person scores the maximum or gets the maximum wickets. Doesn't it happen? We say, you know, dark horse, somebody who, whom we know nothing about. And then, of course, involving everyone in decision making. I need not tell you this, because when you are doing so many things in team, I'm sure you're doing it. At every point, I have given some examples. These slides will remain with you, because they are in Shubhadeep's mail now. Any of you can copy this presentation and look at one point every day to see whether these parameters work for you or not. You know, list, looking at all of them together only gives more and more information to the mind. Vivekananda says, education is not, you know, imbibing information which lies undigested in the mind. It is making use of this information. So, one day per, you know, one sentence per day. Exactly as little Yudhishthira used to learn in the, in the Mahabharata, you know. All the brothers used to learn full lesson by heart. He could learn one sentence, speak the truth, don't tell lies, help others. So the Guruji gave him a nice beating by saying, what a dullard, eldest brother, useless fellow, can't learn anything. Then uh, Yudhishthir said, I consider that I have learnt a lesson when I practice it for one whole day. The others were only learning so much, you know, one big page by heart. <coughs> he was saying he learnt when he practiced it for 24 hours. That is real learning. You know, this is only gathering information, the more and more and more. And then, of course, trusting the team. That brings us to an end of our presentation. I have to say thank you to you because you are a wonderful group. I felt very happy speaking to you. But don't think that is the end. This is only dose number one. <laughs> one more dose remains. Whether it is a bitter pill or a sugar coated pill, or whether it is a useful or useless, all this I will leave you to decide. You know, nothing can be taken for granted. If I come and tell you that what I am going to tell you is the best thing possible, it is not best for every, everybody. What is best for one person might be terrible for the other person. You know, whenever we have a good, happy occasion, we offer sweets to each other. But to a diabetic, that sweet is poison. It's not sweet at all. Me, mu mita kar lije. So, mu mita kaise kare? It's poison. Therefore, you know, we have to choose. Let us come back in, we'll have a break now. 15, 20 minutes break. 12.30 once more.